Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Welcome. This is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in downtown LA. Welcome you to tonight's En Casa con la Plaza. En Casa con la Plaza is our virtual programming direct from our home to yours. Sometimes I do it from my office and sometimes I'm sure you're someplace other than home watching on your smartphone, your laptop, your desktop, whatever. Anyway, these are our virtual series of conversations, presentations, demonstrations and performances that we've been doing since April of 2020 during the pandemic, during the lockdown. And we're gonna continue on because there's just so much Latino, Latinx history, art and culture that we wanna to present to you via these virtual programs. Uh, if you're on Facebook, use the chat or use the comment section, use the Q&A, let us know where you're viewing from, ask questions. We'll be taking them throughout the presentation that we're featuring tonight. Those of you who are uh, on Facebook, please use the comment section as well. You could tell us where you're viewing from, ask questions through there. We'll be uh, taking them as well. And uh, I'll be sharing them with our presenter uh, and to introduce him today, John Urquiza, John Tapia Urquiza. He's worked as an advertising art director and designer for the first half of his career. His array of clientele and projects, they range from Asia, Europe, all over the US, but he's most proud of his work with nonprofit organizations and public projects in his native LA. In the midst of his commercial work, he began teaching design and photography, lecturing for many years on visual communications and production, eventually transitioning into publishing as the editor of photography at a fashion industry publication. In 2012, he embarked on a research project inspired by photographer Dan Nurmark's book, Chavez Ravine. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these photos, uh, historic photos that he took, I think it was in the 40s and 50s. He's, uh, John is recognized in, he recognized in the images the same faces as his aunts, his uncles, his tias, his tios, in a community that was wiped out by the corruption of LA city of LA and different governmental entities. Uh, he developed these photography workshops that his research continues through today, examining the effects of gentrification on the predominantly Latinx community of Northeast LA, currently instructs an immersive college course called Visualizing Gentrification, Bridging Land Use Data and Visual Ethno Ethnography that explores community level research around the effects of gentrification. And I've known John for a, a few years He's uh, both in his uh, previous professional life as an advertising art director, but most recently, of course, as a community activist, as a commu community leader. So come on up, John. Uh, why don't you unmute there, John? I, one of these days, I'm going to get the hang of it, and COVID's going to be over. So You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? It's nice to see you again for after so long. Good to see you too, John. Um. Do uh, you want me to get started or just Let's jump into started. it? Or Yeah, no, please do. Uh, John has been doing these workshops uh, and what he's doing actually, uh, uh, he's compressing a series of presentations that he that take two, three sessions or more. And he's presenting to us within uh, the limited time that we have here in Encasa. So he, you know, just get started. He may be compressing some stuff, but please, uh, any questions, please uh, throw them out on the chat, like I said, and on the, the comment section or the Q&A, and, uh, and we'll take them to see where you where we want to take this conversation. Go, John. Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, again, um, when, I, when I started on this, I started as a photographer looking at the ideas of change in Northeast Los Angeles. I was working out of uh, Avenue 50 Studio. And we were doing workshops there and we called it change but as that uh time unfolded and we embedded more and more with which with what was going on um i became a little bit radicalized i honestly say i went from photographer to activist at that point um and i'm going to show you a few of the things that happened during that process but also many of the things that we've learned from that um and i'll start off with the first thing is gentrification is uh, a bit of a paradox Yes, it gives the appearance that the community is doing well, that it's upgrading, that new things are changing. But one of the uh, the problems with that is it doesn't change for everybody. It's not an equitable change. And you see uh, 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 on the surface what happens, but beneath that, below that, 
uh, you see a lot of uh, a lot more poverty. And I'm going to explain that as we move through there with data and facts, as well as uh, some imagery. Now, uh, the first thing I like to talk about is land and the identity of land and uh, the resilience of culture. And this is another thread that we can go down, but I'm just going to kind of hit the surface of it and talk about who owns the land that we're in. Now, I'm hoping that everybody who's watching and listening is um, is understands and knows who what Northeast Los Angeles is. And I know Abelardo does. And so uh, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of landmarks and, and areas and such. But the first thing I'd like to talk about is what who who did this land belong to before we came along and before they came along and before the people before them came along and we talk about it and it's it's basically we talk about uh the habitat and the culture of the animals that lived here um the uh, coyote the hawk the raccoon uh the owl all those creatures and this is a uh, part of where we start with in a lot of our, our discussions, um, we pay homage to them, but then we, we also pay homage to the first people that were here, uh, the Tongva. And the Tongva um, are still here. This is a family that uh, still practices its Tongva um, uh, cultural practices. And uh, there's a, in this photograph, we have five generations of them. Um, and this is also what I mean by about uh, resilience. Um, you don't typically see them around, but they're still here and they're still practicing and they're still living. And uh, the problem isn't that. The problem is, is that we forget. Our memory uh, is somehow um, lost every time something changes and everything, every time something happens in, this, in our communities. And so that's one of the reasons why I also do this talk. Um, the Tongva populated the Los Angeles area quite prolifically, as you can see here, all the different um, uh, Tongva settlements. Now, what we're, what we're concerned about is two of them, the Yagna, which is at the bottom here, which is where the uh, approximately where Union Station is, and the Hahamonga, which is up here at the top of, of uh, the uh, Arroyo Seco in La Cañada, where, right above the Rose Bowl. And this green area is the Northeast. Now, I want you to kind of familiarize, familiarize yourself with these maps because we're going to zoom in and out and, and around and talk about uh, the area and the space uh, as we go through this. But remember these landmarks. This river here is the Los Angeles River. And this freeway that goes up here is the Pasadena Freeway, which also follows the Arroyo Seco, which the Arroyo Seco again goes all the way up to the Jajamonga. Um, and then down here is the 10 Freeway. And then you see that little nub that ends right there. That's the 710 freeway. And we're going to be dealing with a lot of this area in green and uh, getting and zooming in. In the next image, you'll see the 10 different communities of Northeast Los Angeles, Eagle Rock, Atwater, Glassell Park, Highland Park, Mount Washington, Legion Valley, Cypress Park, Montecito Heights, El Sereno, um, Lincoln Heights. But within these communities, within these, these, these areas that we know, there's dozens of other communities that spring up and they become very regionalized and very specific to different cultures. Um, I, I like to talk about uh, Figueroa Street here and then Monta Vista, which is right next door. And uh, within that area, there's so much diversity in culture and, and, I'll, and I'll talk about it as I kind of go through there. Um, Lincoln Heights is much different than El Sereno. El Sereno is much different than Atwater Village. Actually, it's, it, in some cases it's not, but there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of differences and along with the Elysian Valley. So we're gonna zoom in and out again, keep in mind these landmarks, the LA River, the 10 freeway. And we're gonna talk about this little strip here that's not part of Northeast LA, but it kind of is uh, geographically. This is actually Boyle Heights and this is uh, USC County Hospital and this is the Ramona Gardens area and Hazard Park. Um, they're kind of in a weird no man's land. They're part of Boyle Heights, but they're not part of Boyle Heights in a sense. But they all we, we try to include them in a lot of our research of what happens in Nella. Um, so keep in mind those things. Figueroa is a, another north-south artery to um, keep in mind. Colorado Boulevard, we may talk about it. And then York Boulevard here. York, Figueroa, this is the uh, kind of like the, the main the main arteries of Highland Park. And a lot of what I talk about and a lot of the research kind of centers around Highland Park, but then we step out of that and we're in Lincoln Heights, we're in El Sereno, we're in um, uh, Elysian Valley or Frogtown as it's known. Uh, let's see. So going back to land and the ideas of land, can you imagine that time back 
during the Tongva years, what El Sereno looked like. Um, these rolling hills, what California looked like in general, these beautiful rolling hills um, and, and uh, woodland areas in the valleys. In the background, you can see where uh, probably, I think I wanna say City Terrace Montebello is around there. Um, and you don't, in, in this particular photo, you don't see all the development except off in the distance, but that's the beauty of what we're trying to keep in El Sereno specifically, because it's a lot of rolling hills in, in other parts of the communities. Um, they're different issues and, and gentrification is, is attacking all of these issues as you will see as we move into that. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is a, an area I was out scouting uh, a development that was being built at the bottom of this hill, $31 uh, million dollar homes uh, right here. And if you look closely, this is Soto Street. USC Medical Center is right around the corner. This is the old uh, Broadway warehouses and department stores. Fashion 21 used to be down here. And uh, Hazard Park is back here. Um, and then this is these three towers are right where Indiana Avenue is, where I grew up. But uh, if you look at the road, that's a really scary, narrow road. And this is what it's like. Parts of El Sereno are, are you know, 50 years ago. Um, other parts of, of, of Highland Park are still like that. Uh, we have a very wide landscape and diversity of, of terrain and, and demographics, um, but uh, they're all being threatened by, by certain, certain uh, um, economic interests, we'll say. So the other thing I like to talk about is set up this uh, kind of legacy of displacement that we have around the Northeast. Um, there was uh, the original Chinatown, which again was near the, um, the uh, uh, um, Union Station. Uh, it was called Calle de los Negras. Negros, and um, that was uh, moved to its original, its next location, which is on Broadway now. And then there was something else that I just learned about a lot in my, uh, my, my research was a place called Sonora Town. And Sonora Town was this, this vibrant Mexican community right around um, Broadway and in the, uh, um, and I haven't got quite a fix on it yet, but uh, the stuff that I've read so far is it puts it in the industrial area that is Lincoln Heights on the edge of Chinatown. And it was uh, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of, of adobe structures that uh, uh, was basically a Mexican town within the city of Los Angeles. Um, now this was displaced, this was burned to the ground literally by, by racist uh, uh, attacks over the course of several years. And uh, eventually that went on to form uh, the folks that left there went on to form the communities in the East area. Uh, I want to say Whittier and, and uh, uh, out in those areas because they were forced out of Los Angeles. Now Sonora Town is fascinating because it was had a town square where there was um, um, political orations, um, uh, all kinds of community things happening. It was it, you know it was like it was like the Placita that we know now, but it wasn't the Hollywood version. It was the real deal. And we could still see some of the architecture that wasn't burned down. Uh, on the USC campus, there's a few buildings that are adobe buildings. And then if, also, if you look into Griffith Park, there's a couple of adobe buildings that are uh, kind of left over from this era. Um, but that was a rich, not just architectural history, but cultural history that we lost. And of course, you all know uh, Chavez Ravine, La Loma, Bishop, and Solana Canyon, um, where about 5,000 families were, um, were uh, displaced. Uh, from their home. I'm not going to get too much into that, but let me show you the map of where they are at. So Chinatown was down here. This is a Union Station. So Nora Town was in between this area. I mentioned that that uh, uh, Griffith Park Adobe House and then the other Griffith, the other Adobe House was over here by, um, by the USC. Um, and then we had Chavez Ravine, which we pretty much know the story about that. And then there was a few more that came later on during the urban, uh, urban um, renewal period of the 60s and 70s, Bunker Hill. Uh, estimates are between 25,000 and 50,000 people were displaced from Bunker Hill. We know it now as museums, uh, the opera house, uh, art galleries, um, uh, lots of housing and lots of uh, skyscrapers and, and banks. Uh, but the community that was there before all this was this vibrant Latino community with uh, Filipino elements and also indigenous um, the diaspora from Arizona that had come to Los Angeles looking for their fortune. 
and also it was a it was also a big LGBTQ community. And this was literally wiped off the face of the earth with shovels and 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 uh, if you saw any of the imagery from that time period of when they were making Bunker Hill, um, it was a uh, beautiful old homes, much like Highland Park, much of the much of that uh, the housing stock was like that. Um, and and again, just torn from the roots and laid laid to waste with concrete for some of the richest families in Los Angeles that we know now. Um, then again, you all are kind of familiar with Interstate 5 and the interchange. There's actually a couple of really good movies. There's, I think Sabrina Colette is going to be on your, your talk pretty soon. And she did a movie about Interstate 5 and the interchange there. Um, and then there's also a, a good movie about Bunker Hill called The Exiles, which, um, which is a beautiful, as photography goes, I love watching that movie because it's beautiful to watch. Um, and uh, nobody's made a movie about Chavez Ravine, but uh, all in, or Sonora Town, or even Chinatown. But these are all important uh, uh, spaces that were lost to some type of displacement. Again, not necessarily gentrification, but the same economic forces. They wanted it, and they took it, and they made it theirs. And this is kind of like what's happening in gentrification. And I'll again describe that as it as it happens. But what we talk about in this thread, and usually when we, if we had the time, is we look at, we try to examine how should land be valued? And that's just a question I want to put out to you guys. How should land be valued? Is it economic productivity? Is it cultural productivity? Should it be uh, determined by the population or the people who own it? A lot of the land, well, most of the land, all of the land actually is stolen land that we're, that we're living on. So who has claim to that? Who has, um, you know, value to that? Even, even, you know, notwithstanding the uh, the theft from the Tongva people, we also have land that was stolen by the next generation of, of carpetbaggers. Um, uh, a friend of mine is doing really great research on on, on that local stuff, um, and he was discussing uh, uh, how uh, Northeast Los Angeles Highland Park uh, were uh, basically uh, kind of. I say, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go quite far and say is robbed from the original uh, Spanish land grants of the um, of the uh, San Rafael uh, um, uh, 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 rancho that was there. But essentially, the guy who took it took it based on a tax lien that he that the person couldn't pay. He took the land, um, but he got his money. Uh, uh, the, the name was uh, Glassell named after Glassell Park or Glassell Park was named after him. He bought that entire area with money that he'd used from his family that had sold all their slaves in the South. Um, and uh, hoping uh, Luis Trujillo, who's writing these papers, will uh, get published soon and look for his name out there. And he talks a lot about this stuff. Um, but again, how is land valued? Who, who has the rights to it? The people who are living on it and, and making it productive, uh, the people who have title to it, uh, think about that for a minute as we go through this process. Um, and how much say does the government have in it? Right, right now, I'm going to explain how we've come to the present time, and the government is a big factor in a lot of what's happening in gentrification, which I'll explain in a second. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, though, is a couple of the two of the eight studies that we've done. The first one is a displacement study that we did along Avenue 57 and Avenue 52, and it was kind of um, triggered by our local city councilman who said displacement is an urban myth. This was in the Los Angeles Times when he was running for office and all of our housing rights people just kind of flipped out. So I said, we gotta prove this wrong. So we went into doing this study. Uh, we looked at uh, this area here, as you can see, this is Figueroa. Uh, York Boulevard is up here, but Figueroa, I mentioned Monta Vista is right here. This is the gold line that runs in between them. The green area is the area that we studied. The red area is business district. This blue area was a second study that we didn't get to, uh, but we found so much information within this study here, um, which I'm going to share in a second, that it, it just it kind of like we just knew we didn't we didn't need to know anymore. And the point of this study was uh, proving that displacement is real and that this is this is an example of direct displacement, basically. And I'm going to talk about both of those two: direct displacement and indirect displacement. And direct displacement. Um, people are, are, are literally forced out by the first, first level of, of owner or persons who own that. So in this study, uh, we found 1,200 units along that, along that space that I just showed you, 1,204 units. And of those 1,204 units, 
we es we estimated based on um, on personal interviews and looking at the property sales that 23 percent of the population in this area was displaced. Now you apply that 23 percent across Highland Park, and that's 17,000 people that were displaced in a three-year period from home sales, uh, apartment flipping. Um, these are all direct displacements. This is an indirect displacement yet. This is direct displacement. Um, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood of, of about 72, 73,000 people, 17,000 people were economically displaced from that, that area. Um, some of the other stuff that we found, this was, I, I have so many facts on this. I pick them, choose them really carefully. This one was always strikes me. This particular uh, piece of data always strikes me that a, almost a third of those people, of families living in there were single parent families. And when we get into the organizing and I start talking about the people and, and, and folks that we, that we organize with in housing rights, it made sense. We started seeing a lot of single mothers um, fighting, for, uh, um, fighting for their housing rights. Um, but this this proved it. 18% single parent uh, uh, female families and 8% uh, uh, male parent families. And then the 31% um, were no families at all. A lot of those are the newer folks that moved in that didn't have kids. And then we had other families at 43%. But uh, that's how it breaks down with families. And I was astounded to see so many single parent families in Highland Park. Some going back in the way back machine uh, in year... 2000, the medium home price in Highland Park was $159,000. I need an echo machine for that. $159,000. Okay. Um, a little more of the population was foreign. A third of the population was foreign board, uh, Mexican, Salvadoran, Filipinos, Guatemalan. And most of that, or more than half of that population came to the U.S. before 1980. Uh, in 2010, the median home price was 380,000 to 479,000. We found on the high side, the Latino and Asian populations contracted. The black, popula black population increased 0.2 percent. Family size shrunk from 3.8 percent to 3.1 percent um, because we were already starting to see some displacement at that point. So the next one, the next slide, I, I just I, this I want to impress upon you how great this is. This is this is uh, in 2010 there were 73,000 73, people in Highland Park proper. Um, in 2021, there is now 63,000 uh, people in Highland Park, um, which is a huge decrease. The re what, what happened was, is the Latino population was 72% at one point. Now in 2021 in Highland Park, the Latino population is 51% of the population. We're barely the majority in Highland Park. Um, this again, fits with our census data as to what was happening. Uh, and with, again, with our study that we lost 23% of our population um, due to displacement uh, and displacement takes all kinds of forms, indirect displacement, direct displacement. A direct displacement could be uh, a raising of the rent, an eviction, harassment, um, all these different things. But in reality, that 17,000 is even higher because we're not factoring indirect displacement. Now, Policymakers love numbers like this, but I, again, one of the things I noticed when I did my talks with just photography is that it didn't, it, 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 like it resonated, but this data like this kind of changed the idea of what was going on. It was, um, uh, and so I'm kind of flipping around my presentation. Sometimes I start with photography, sometimes I start with data. Today I started with data and I'm gonna bring going to the human side, but, but I realized that you need both of them to make an impact. Um, cause one is abstract and the other one is too real. Uh, and, uh, it doesn't, it, you know, it could be anecdotal if you look at a photograph of somebody and say, oh, they got displaced. So I try to really bring the impact of this to folks on how and what is happening now, right now, uh, in the future, uh, these are the next big drivers of gentrification. Uh, this is from the next study that was in Lincoln Heights. And you can see here the river is again, the uh, Arroyo Seco, the 10 freeway. We have three major projects going on. Three, again, much like the urban revitalization of the 10 freeway, uh, the interchange uh, and uh, Bunker Hill. These are three major infrastructure projects. The Los Angeles River Revitalization, which expects up to uh, 
six billion dollars in investment. It's either four or six. I have so many numbers in my head. I apologize, um, and I get confused. But I believe it's either four or six billion dollars in, and that's B with a billion. Echo Machine right now. Um, this is uh, uh, of investment in this purple area, um, known as the Whittier Narrows. Uh, I'm sorry, the Glendale Narrows, and um, one billion is coming from the city. One billion is coming from the federal government, and the other four billion is coming from private investment. The other big infrastructure project is here is the USC Biotech Corridor. Remember that photo of the hillside and the car hood? It was taken right here, looking down this valley, and right around that bend on one of those tiny little tiny streets up there. This area is actually zoned as farmland along this hillside. And then you have Ascot Reservoir. But the USC Biotech Corridor wants to go from Cal State, U Cal State LA all the way to the USC campus. Um, and uh, they want to be able to uh, turn that whole corridor of industrial land into office space, hotels, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, uh, uh, biotech offices, research facilities, medical labs. Uh, uh, and what they're, what they're, they don't have a, an investment number that they're releasing, but they have an aspiration that it will be an $8 billion investment from private investors. USC hasn't talked about how much they're actually investing into that area, but um, uh, uh, they're, they're wishing that it could be $8 billion of investment in this quarter. So you have $8 billion on one side, $6 billion on the other side. And in the middle, there are people who are still paying $700 a month rent in some of these places around here. Now there's one more place that I didn't mention, and it's this red line here called the CASP. Um, the CASP is known as the Cornfield Arroyo Specific Plan. And um, that is because it's named after the Cornfield Park that's here, uh, that was an art project. This was all land that was all owned by the railroad and is now owned by a, uh, uh, I believe a, a, a part of the state, but also um, the, it's run by a nonprofit whose um, family, whose president of the nonprofit is, was a former family or a family member of that railroad company called Catalyst. Um, and so it didn't go far uh, uh, from their hands, but uh, a lot of that, th that, that area is along the park here. Now, CASP is essentially 900 acres of rezoning from industrial land to uh, um, housing. And we have had uh, lots of, we have no number on how much the investment's going to be, but essentially Ed Reyes, a former councilman, has ca characterized it as an entire new city between Lincoln Heights and Chinatown on the left here. Two traditionally poorest neighborhoods of the Northeast. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Chinatown has about a 55% poverty rate. Lincoln Heights, Lincoln Heights has about a 48% poverty rate. And in the middle, they wanna put a new city with uh, 10 and 14 story high rises throughout this whole area. Think about that for a second. Think about the billions of dollars. Think about who lives, if you know the neighborhood, think about who lives in these neighborhoods along here and who lives along this area, along Chinatown. Uh, in Chinatown, there's a lot of retired elderly um, Chinese folks that live here who are on a fixed income of, of their social security. Lincoln Heights is a huge immigrant uh, community um, uh, we, um, you know, and, and then there's a few, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get into the stats in a second, but, but think about this for a second. We're going to get back to it and talk about it a little bit more, but these are the next big, um, things that will be driving gentrification and how we got there. I'll show you in a second. Oh, here we go. So the neighborhoods that I mentioned, El Sedano, Lincoln Heights, Chinatown, Frogtown, Glassell Park, Boyle Heights. You can see here, Chinatown, the one with the 55% poverty rate is also 89% renters. That means 11% of the population owns all that land that those people live on. And they're the ones that are gonna make the money when, the, when, when, uh, when they start uh, building all those high, well, actually they've already started building a lot of those high rises. Um, the next highest one is uh, Lincoln Heights with 69% renters. And then uh, El Sereno, Frogtown, Glassell Park. I mentioned how similar they were. This is why they are, called bedroom communities where there's a lot of home ownership, which kind of mirrors what's going on in the state of California. The state of California is 55% uh, renters and 45% um, uh, landlords. Um, 
or reversed. I'm sorry. Uh, and then Boyle Heights, uh, I can't see it because of the, the windows there, but Boyle Heights is again, is one is, is, is up there. 81% renters. Um, and those homeowners are the ones that are going to make off, but they're the renters are the ones that are going to get clobbered by all this. Oops. Now, this is, uh, I'm going to jump into it. Bear with me with the technical stuff and the mapping stuff. Uh, there again, we see our LA River. This is what we call a rent burden buffer. This is the, uh, uh, the um, uh, biotech corridor, also known as the health science campus expansion, the LA River. And the rent burden buffer basically says that within these three areas, the rent is going to raise at three different uh, uh, um, uh, um, three different uh, uh, um, levels. Closest, it's going to be the highest and most uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, uh, we don't have a percentage on that, but anything that, 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 that's close to this is going to be a very high rent increase. And by the end of it, uh, it's going to be, it's going to subside little by little, depending on its proximity to, again, all the pro all this amenities that are going to be coming in here of this. In, in this case, there's dozens of luxury condominiums and dozens of, of, of parks, a park and uh, green spaces. Uh, this is going to be office and um, and biotech. And something that we're seeing already is right around here is a 42. Well, even here, where I where I pointed out the photograph that was taken, this is this is the 32 million dollar homes, 32 one million dollar homes right within that buffer, um, because when you make a biotech science corridor and you have all these uh, research facilities they primarily hire phds who are making two hundred thousand dollars and above them being able to afford a million dollar house is probably not a big hardship the statistics that we had earlier so this fits well within our rent buffers rents are going to go up land values are going to go up um and so on but uh uh now our rent buffer We've kind of ended it here at the freeway, even though it continues. So the numbers you are about to see next only take into account everything on this side of the freeway in the Northeast LA. It will probably be even bigger and more if we included these numbers. But again, I'm sorry, I tend to focus on Northeast Los Angeles like that. We have in that rent buffer area, 103,000 renters that will be at risk. Echo Machine, 103,000 people at risk. Now, if we apply what we learned in the first study, that 23% of that population is going to be in, is going to be directly displaced when these properties start flipping, we're going to see 37,000 people directly displaced in that in that corridor, in those two corridors between El Sereno and Frogtown and Atwater. That's 37,000 people. And I, I mean, it boggles me sometimes when I hear that number uh, and I don't want to get desensitized by it. So um, I just, I, I think about that for a second. And I'm going to just keep that in mind for while we talk. And I'm going to go in with what, with, with what I talk about mostly is uh, gentrification is violence. And uh, I'm going to explain that as it relates to the data that we just saw. Because a lot of people think, again, in the abstract, 37,000 people have to move out of the neighborhood. They don't think how traumatic that is. They don't think of the, of the, of the, of the actions that happens that they just think, oh, they're going to move someplace else and they forget about it. Well, it's not that simple. It's far more um, egregious and, and far more um, horrifying and traumatic if you're one of those families. And, I, and, I'm, and that's what we do. And that's what we talk about mostly in those cases. Um, in gentrification, we have what I call the six fingers uh, of, 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 of greed and, and crimes. Um, the first one is, again, tenants' rights. And we've seen a lot of tenants' rights happening in the last several, three, four years. And a lot of it has become because has, has come to the surface because of, uh, of the displacement issues that we're going to, I'm going to talk about a little bit more in, deep, in depth. But then we also have homelessness. And that we know of. We see that every day on the streets. Um, this has also exploded. We have, I want to say, 54,000 homeless folks on the streets right now, and that number keeps changing. It keeps keeps climbing. When I first when I first started talking about homelessness, it was is around 37,000, 40,000, and it just keeps climbing and keeps climbing. 
Um, and these are also areas of study and also threads that I go deep into in other discussions. Uh, the main thing I'm going to talk about where we're at now is land use and planning, which I'll get into later. And then we also see a lot of discrimination and criminalization of, of people of color. Uh, this is a huge one. In the USC battle right now for USC's expansion, uh, communities are fighting against them because, and, and they're fighting against um, uh, abolishing the USC police because they harass the community kids in the area and they criminalize them uh, and stop them. And the USC police actually has policing powers. Uh, they can arrest you if, if they see cause. Um, and they're the only uh, college campus safety officers that can do that, that we know in the Los Angeles area. Occidental, where I teach at, doesn't have that. Um, Loyola Marymount doesn't have that. Only USC. And uh, a lot of those folks uh, think that, that that's, this is wrong. Another thing that we see is theft in, of culture and businesses. We see a lot of appropriation of Latino businesses because somebody moves into the area and they think, oh, it's a Latino business. I'm going to be Latino too. And uh, we see some of that culture disappear. But also the businesses are also affected by this displacement factor of direct and indirect displacement. Um, just to briefly talk about that, um, there was uh, in, on, in one year in 2015, uh, that was probably the height of displacement in Highland Park. We saw, uh, I want to say, five commercial buildings on Figueroa uh, sold during one summer, and we lost about 22 businesses. Um, and several people became homeless because they lived upstairs and they converted those apartments into offices or creative offices. Uh, and we saw also some Airbnb units come in and take over some of the affordable housing. Again, affordable housing is, are the, is that housing that's built before 1987. This again, this is all before the rent control laws have started to change. Um, and, uh, and, and so 22 businesses with only five buildings sold. Uh, and, and, and we see a lot of that. And then the last one that a lot of people don't know about and don't talk about much because we don't know a lot about it. There's only a couple of people doing research on this. Uh, a doctor, Fully Love out of Chicago and um, a study out of uh, Oakland by uh, Kausa Husta was done that explained uh, that in gentrifying neighborhoods, the elderly and the poor, uh, their mortality rate is higher than every other group in those gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, I didn't catch the percentage on that, but uh, Dr. Foley Love also talks about this in, in, in her work, and um, they also have more stats on how uh, gentrification and displacement uh, creates root shock, which uh, is essentially uh, when you get displaced, you disrupt your healing processes, you disrupt a lot of the, um, uh, the things that you're going through, and it perpetuates uh, things that are in the family like alcoholism, uh, substance abuse, um, uh, domestic violence, it just perpetuates us because they don't get a chance to heal. They don't get a chance to talk about it. They don't get a chance to develop their economic um, uh, sources. And uh, it leads to all kinds of health consequences. So these six things are the big, are the big things with gentrification. And uh, one more thing about theft of culture we've been seeing in Highland Park a lot of is uh, mural erasure, whitewashing of culture and uh, replacement with um, uh, newer uh, uh, murals, uh, promoting a business, promoting a different culture and promoting a different kind of, 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 of lifestyle as it were. Um, and uh, what else? I think, I think I've said a lot about that. Um, but again, like I said, a lot of the stuff I talk about are these threads that go into each of these. And a lot of our, our, um, our um, ethnographic studies deal with the tenants rights, homelessness, a little bit of land using and uh, the culture of business. Health consequences, again, like I said, we don't have a lot of data on that. It's very difficult to, 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 um, to track that. Um, and discrimination of uh, POC is another one that, it's, that you, you kind of need to be on the ground when it happens in order to, to, to catch it into a, a photographic essay or a story. So um, let's talk about drivers of gentrification. And the big driver, uh, as I mentioned in the, uh, um, in the uh, uh, Lincoln Heights area, in CASP, uh, CASP was rezoned by the city planning department. Um, and the LA River, again, was, a, was an idea of, of the LA city and the federal government and the, the Army Corps of Engineers to return that to a more natural habitat. Um, so there, there's a, a couple things. Um, 
Then again, and, and again, those are billions of dollars. Then we have uh, home flipping. Um, this is a really small investment. This is what we first saw in, in El Sereno, not El Sereno, um, in, Link, in, <laughs> in uh, Highland Park on the York side. Uh, this is personal wealth, low investment, medium return on investment, in migration of a Gen X crowd. The uh, creative economy came in. Uh, a lot of LGBTQ folks moved in. Um, these are all cultural creators. These were the pioneers that moved in. They were home flipping. Again, very low investments. Uh, this is about the time when housing was about $479,000, uh, $300,000. Um, these artist types were moving into the community and and basically trying to become part of the community. They weren't, not, a lot of them weren't quite set up to create cultural centers, but eventually they became that. They became the cultural uh, center that started to replace the Latino culture that was in the community. Um, here's a good example. Uh, uh, again, I embed with people. I try to make myself friendly, but then they don't realize that, you know, they tell me these stories and I don't mean to disparage them by saying that they're bad because they don't know they're bad, but this is what the guy told me. He says, yeah, I bought this house for $250,000 and this is a developer. He lives in Highland Park. He's a person of color. He has three kids. Um, he uh, works in the entertainment industry. He bought this house for about $250,000. He sold it maybe three to five years later. Uh, there was a woman named Dolores living in there. She lived there 15 years before he even bought it. Um, and uh, she was uh, living on a um, Section 8 housing. So a lot of her rent was subsidized. And uh, he sells this house for about $475,000, almost $500,000. And he made almost a quarter of a million profit on this one house. And this is around Avenue 26 uh, in, in Glassell Park. Um, so he, the guy who bought the house was from Chicago. Never saw it in person, bought it on the internet, just as is. Um, and, uh, and this guy made a lot of money. Dolores, the woman who lived there, uh, it was not a rent-controlled unit, but he explained to me that, again, he paid her $5,000 when she moved out. Um, and he felt that this was sufficient, uh, you know, to, to help relocate her. Um, and I'll explain that process in a second. But Dolores ended up moving around the corner uh, to another uh, small house. I don't know what's happened to her since then. This was probably around 2014, 2015. Um, but $5,000 is practically nothing. The city, uh, when you pay relocation fees, the city suggests that, you, that, that it's a minimum of $7,500. Um, and some people have made uh, upwards of $75,000 as relocation money uh, because the values are so high on, on property that $75,000 is nothing. They will make that back. The landlord will make that back in a matter of a year or two by raising the rents double, if not more than double. So this developer uh, only did one house, uh, one or two houses. I think he only did one, but he made a quarter million dollars with expenses of about $5,000 for Dolores' relocation. But I've interviewed developers that were doing 15 houses a month in Highland Park. Uh, and then when Highland Park dried up and it was too expensive for them, they moved to South LA. Uh, they would look at 30 to 40 houses and buy 15 of them slap some paint on them, do some renovation, sell them. They would make about $15,000 to $20,000 a piece on each of those houses. Um, and then they got too expensive for them. So this home flipping was a, was, a, was a small industry going on for quite some time. With that home flipping, this is a, a Cafe de Leche, which um, uh, uh, I always call is the, the, um, the, the uh, um, what do they call it? The... Um, the epicenter of gentrification on York Boulevard. And this is probably the first thing to go. Uh, um, and one of the things that struck me in that change in that gentrification was the language changed. All the flyers uh, on the windows of the businesses used to be Spanish. And then one day I looked up and everything was in English and everything was advertising things that um, the community didn't use or didn't, or well, the, the original community didn't use. Um, and and uh, it, again, it became part of that creative economy, cultural uh, um, layer that got placed on top of, of, of this. Um, 
And you can see it uh, in this, it represented by this, these, these posters of Cafe de Leche. Um, in the background, Bicycle Doctor changed three different times in that time period between then and now. And then it finally went out of business. Um, and now it's another uh, coffee shop. And as I mentioned, uh, this is kind of a, a, a composite of a lot of the folks that first moved in. Gen Xers, much older, uh, they had a uh, buying power to, um, to, uh, to put down payment on a house, but they're part of the creative economy. And these were the first ones that you saw starting to change. Um, and they try to, they, a lot of them try to keep a low profile and, and be part of the community. But again, they're, they're cultural creators, I like to call them. What happened later was that, um, well, okay, so I'll explain it in the multi-unit investment. This is, this is another next investment wave that came in. And this shifted from York Boulevard to Figueroa. And this is where we did our study of the 1,200 units and the 23% uh, uh, um, displacement rate. But the pools of wealth are increased. They're targeting millennials and a creative lifestyle in migration. Now, the creative lifestyler is not what you saw in the Gen Xer. The creative lifestyler um, is basically just somebody who uh, wants to live that, that creative lifestyle. They'll buy Pottery Barn or they'll buy... Um, uh, what's that uh, that um, place where they sell the Velvet Jesuses? I can't remember the name of the retail store. But again, they're all about lifestyle. They are uh, uh, younger. They uh, want to purchase the lifestyle. They're not actually creating art or creative lifestyle. They want to be there. The person that takes the guitar class, uh, if I could just kind of like give you a brief outline of who they are. Um, and again, going back to Cafe de Leche, uh, this is a, a notorious real estate agent in the area um, and her pug, uh, she was responsible for a lot of people. Uh, she, she basically found people apartments and she came from, I wanna say Silver Lake and she was all the people in Silver Lake, she was finding them apartments here in, Los, in, in Highland Park. And she had a very, very good business for a very long time. Uh, I don't know how she's doing now, but essentially um, uh, uh, this is the, again, the neighborhood started to change. I would sit in that exact same chair and have my coffee because my office was upstairs um, and uh, in the very early days. And I remember I could hear Spanish being spoken all around me and maybe 10 or 12 people an hour would pass by. Um, and uh, again, I count because I worked in fashion and retailing, I count you know, traffic uh, to retail spaces. And so 10 or 12 people was, was one of the things I was doing was counting people. And then by this time, this time period, um, the la Spanish language had disappeared. And I was, I was hearing only English and maybe French, oddly enough, and sometimes an Australian accent. But the traffic increased from 10 to 12 people per hour to nearly 40 to 50 people per hour. Um, and again, boggling that the change would happen like that. But think about that. With that, that doesn't just mean people, that means revenue to these businesses, that revenue means taxes, to the government, it all means an increased uh, 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 change in the economics, not just people coming in. And again, gentrification isn't about just about people, it's about economics. Now, something else that happened, and I love this photo uh, from the uh, Channel 62 News, um, but uh, something else happened. I'm gonna talk more in depth about this particular fight, but I was talking about the home, or the, of home flipping and then the multi-unit or apartment flipping. This particular landlord on the right, her name is Galena Wasserman. She bought the building literally right next door to the um, uh, um, the Highland Park train station. If you know that apartment building, uh, I know I've been of the rides by it every day. It's kind of painted gray and black, um, and uh, you see, and 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 the she paid fourteen point two five million dollars for it, and the first week that she took possession of it. She started evicting um, families from there. Uh, there were 57 families living in there. She started evicting them. And this was a, 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 one of our, again, a case studies that I'm gonna show you in a second of organizing against uh, landlords and um, uh, this destructive power of gentrification. Now she's a full up millennial and I'm not disparaging millennials. Don't, don't, don't uh, hate me for that. But, but I'll tell you why millennials are 
a lot of the problem. Um, and this is, again, this is my theory at this point, uh, and I haven't gotten data to prove it, but uh, there's enough, uh, uh, you know, talking about this, we, we know that uh, it, this happens. So after each war that we have, and uh, the first, and, and World War II is one of the big ones, and we have the baby boomers out of that. Well, after each war, we have a population boom, and those are the baby boomers that, that came. But the millennials came after Gulf War I and Gulf War II. This was their baby boom, in a sense. And so they are in now in the economic cycle and the economic river that we're part of. And, and that's one of the reasons why we're feeling gentrification so harshly is because this it's like a, a rat traveling through a snake. Um, is you have this large population that was born after a war, and they've come to their, uh, they've come to adulthood, and they're now needing resources, jobs, housing, uh, all kinds of things. And one, as as a marketer, uh, about ten years ago, we saw a lot of this, this you know, marketing you know papers to millennials and how to talk to them and how to do this and how to do that. And they're going to be the greatest, uh, um, you know, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know, piggy bank in marketing. To, uh, to advertising and marketers around the world because they're gonna have a lot of wealth. Um, and so that started to build up. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why we see that. So we see these, these folks that are that, that age group coming into it. Not all millennials are, are, um, are rich, I've discovered. Um, and, uh, and, but, they're, but they're also, but they're part of that process that they need to find housing. And the guy biting his lip is, their attorney, is her attorney. And I forget his name. But watch out for him if you have to fight him for an eviction. He's pretty, uh, pretty dastardly. Um, so this is what happens in the multi-unit uh, waves. The next thing is now a next, another wave of, in, of home investment, higher capital investment, long-term return on investment. Uh, these people want to move in, but they're uh, more lifestylers and creative economy, but they're also the mainstream people that move in. Uh, people that are, uh, um, you know, Pretty vanilla, if I may describe them that way, uh, about their things, and and they they you know they 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 follow the trends. They don't make the trends, and so they also have a lot more money, and uh, that pushes the prices up even higher for a lot of things. Um, I'm showing this photo. This was uh, one of the first protests. Again, there's our favorite spot. The epicenter is Cafe de Leche, and and. Um, uh, this was one of the first marches in 20, late 2014, and uh, uh, this was done by Nella, which I'm going to talk a lot more in a second. But uh, these guys uh, are went around the eviction mark, basically started here and went down York Boulevard and went down Figueroa and uh, essentially eviction notices on all the businesses that were uh, that they considered gentrifiers in there, and they were well vetted. A lot of the businesses uh, were new. They were uh, not um, friendly to uh, locals. Uh, their prices were too high, uh, and they weren't culturally re culturally relevant to the community at that point. I think I might have a shot of that. But I want to point out the guy to the right holding the open house sign. He's a realtor, and um, he uh, uh, was in the neighborhood. And uh, I want keep an eye on him because we're going to talk about him in a second. Excuse me. And what's odd is that he was picking up the signs. And he wanted to see what was going on, and he wandered right into my shot. And I thought, okay, I got a money maker here. I'm not, I never sold this one to the press. I actually sold another one to the press from this, but this was awesome because it's now part of the slideshow. And he helped set up a couple other things because what happened in the later years after this is I recognized the logo, and he became now part of the story of displacement. You see here, this was in my mail. I live in Eagle Rock, and so I get a lot of mail. This is this is the guy down here, um, and that's his wife and uh, uh, one of their POC employees. And um, they recently sold this house in Highland Park on, I forgot what street it was, but if you read the, the postcard, you'll see it, uh, for $1.4 million in Highland Park. Uh, and this is, I wanna say it's off of Monta Vista, one of the streets I was talking about. But uh, again, um, they, this was years and years of development they are now reaping the benefits of this. Um, and real estate agents, yeah, they can be the bad guys. They can help you find a house, but they're also making a tremendous amount of profit and they're brokers and they're there to drive up the prices. Something unique about this, and it's not excusable in a sense,
but they also because I, I I embedded at the at the um, at the homeless shelter in Highland Park, these are the folks that came in, and they would feed once at once I don't know every couple months they would come in and they would make dinner for our homeless shelter guests, and I commended them for that, but at the same time, here they are creating displacement at a huge scale, and it wasn't just indirect displacement like this raising the value of land. I found out later that their offices are in Frank's camera, which uh, was upstairs is where there was um, a guy and his girlfriend were living that became homeless when that building sold and they turned it into offices and they moved into those offices. So that was again, a case of direct displacement. But how do you offset that by making these millions and millions of dollars, um, you know, or, or, or bringing the land value up to millions of dollars? They're making several hundred thousand dollars or several thousand dollars off of this. But how do you offset that? How do you, you know, how do you square that? Um, and I think that that's something that uh, people need to talk about more. You you can't just help people, but at the same time displace them or help displace them. Um, I, I, again, very problematic issues um, with a lot of real estate agents. The next one is land investment, major capital investments, long-term uh, return on investment, uh, institutional investors, multi-unit unit investment. Um, a lot of these multi-unit properties are now being invested on by large corporations um, and smaller corporations, but also development of new apartments and new luxury units and small lot housing subdivisions. And that's going to be the, 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 the crux of what I'm going to talk about in a second. This is at a historic preservation overlay zone meeting, part of the planning department. This is a team that's going to build 30 houses on Avenue 50 and Figueroa. They bought an old church property and they took the five lots, tore them down, built their property. This is the very first public meeting that they're having for this. And this was back in 2014, 15, I want to say. Uh, you can kind of tell everybody's role. The guy with the hipster glasses and the frosted tips is obviously the architect. The long suffering architect's assistant who's got to carry everything. Um, and then this is the uh, this is a little more obscure one. She's the consultant that guides them through the planning department. This is the developer and construction manager guy who oversees the entire project um, with his Starbucks. Uh, and then this guy is from the family that owns the building or that owns a development company. And he's the son of the developer. And this particular development company, Carlson, Carlson, I believe, uh, has done over 500 projects throughout the state of California. Um, in luxury homes. And what, they, what they're planning here is 30, uh, 900,000, at the time was $900,000 homes, but somehow they managed to uh, skirt that. We didn't catch it how or why in the process, but then they ended up building 33 homes. Um, and this is a little bit of their story and a little bit of their case study. Um, this was another hearing in the city planning department downtown. And the guy with the smirk is obviously the developer. Um, this is our activists. Uh, uh, and, and comrade who is testifying about the displacement and the, and the suffering that's going to happen in the community. Again, using that rent, but, rent burden buffer uh, uh, of the units and the apartments that are going to raise rents as a result of this. Um, this is a little local business dealer who I'll, I may talk about later. Um, there's our, um, our uh, uh, um, uh, uh, planning department assistant. And then this is the architects POC diversity hire that they brought in in case they needed to, 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 to speak to that. Um, in the end, the planning department, the city of Los Angeles voted for this project. Um, 33, 30 ended up 33 homes, uh, very modern as you can see in the middle of a, a neighborhood that was uh, uh, surrounded by 600 low income units, we calculated. And if you remember that study with the 1200 units, it was that blue, it was that blue area that we were gonna study that we never got to that's where this property was. Um, and uh, we just, the, the second they broke, the, they broke ground, we, were, we had already heard of the first displacement. There was a gentleman around the corner that had um, essentially uh, been served an eviction notice while he was in prison at county jail. Um, and uh, the landlord was trying to get him out uh, while, he was out while he was incarcerated um, and trying to get him to court and get that whole, that whole thing um, uh, uh, judged 
and uh, um, finalized. So when he came back, he would not be able to have an apartment. But that was like the first one. And then we also had a health concern. There was another person who was served an eviction notice and had a heart attack within like a couple of days of that of that um, of that eviction notice. And uh, again, this is within on the same block as this new project. Project uh, those land values rising. I want to leave you with this. This is a current map that we've started on the study. Again, you see the river and uh, the uh, uh, biotech corridor. These are projects that are going on. What we started originally was, uh, again, this again in this area, we had community members on their phone telling us data, mapping data of this project, that project, this homeless encampment, this thing going on. I removed all the homeless encampments and only left. Um, I think I think I no no I didn't remove the homeless encampments. Uh, because this is one on Huntington. But what we found out as we started to publish this, um, we decided to increase it and go up north into Highland Park. And so this is about uh, 30 projects. And some of them are not on here yet because this map is constantly changing. We actually have three more to add in El Sereno. I mentioned that 32 luxury homes uh, on that spur of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, biotech corridor. And then there's another here on Lombardi and um, uh, uh, Eastern Avenue. Both of those are tied directly to USC in the sense that, again, where are these you know, uh, PhDs and, and researchers going to live uh, in, you know, what kind of housing are they accustomed to? It's gonna be these two places that, that, that they're probably gonna afford to uh, be able to afford. Um, but that's El Sereno. If you look over here, we actually have the Hyatt Hotel, which is being built on the campus. We have a Hilton Hotel that has been proposed for Soto Street and Main Street. We have another hotel over here by St. Vincent de Paul's along San Fernando Road, which is a 200 unit hotel. It's almost built. It, they're, they're working on finishes and finishing this up. This is a, a, a very boutique hotel, probably not associated with, with the Hyatt, but also uh, part of the, um, of the um, of kind of like the Olympic waves of hotels that are coming in. But then we also have right here, this is where CASP was on the edge of CASP. We have 900 luxury lofts that were proposed by the um, by the Riboli family, which owns San Antonio Winery. They own about 30 properties in the area. A lot of them they're converting to lofts and luxury units. Uh, this is one of their major projects. We have uh, about another 200 units in this mixed use creative. A thousand luxury units here, right in the edge of Chinatown, and then another one which is 500 plus luxury units um, right next to that. And this is right off the Chinatown station. 52 work lofts. We have a couple other uh, things that we didn't log in. Up here is something called the Casitas Lofts, which is 419 luxury units. A lot of these folks are in our, our coalition fighting the land use, uh, um, the land use department, land use, um, sorry, city planning department and their local councilmen. This is O'Farrell's council district. This is Cedillo's and this is Kevin De Leon's. Um, the, the, um, uh, we have the, the most egregious one. This is the 32, 33 lot small lot homes I mentioned. Uh, the most egregious one right now is these 10 small lot homes where there's eight families living there that they're on Avenue 50 and they're preparing and figuring out ways to kick them out with either um, uh, an Ellis Act eviction, which is like the nuclear bomb of evictions. They don't have to pay anything. Uh, they can just say, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to rent this unit anymore. We're not going to use it as housing anymore. And we want everybody to leave. Uh, that's one of their considerations, but also other considerations are um, that uh, they're going to pay payouts to some families to get them out. Eight families to build 10 $900,000 homes right there on Avenue 50. If you know Avenue 50, there's a lot of dense apartment buildings right there, right across the street from uh, Nightingale School, I believe it's called. Um, don't hold me to the names because I have too much information in my head. Um, but think about this. This is where we're at now. Uh, uh, from a few uh, evictions and home flipping to all these new developments, this is the next wave of gentrification is land use and planning. I'm gonna skip this because we've already talked a lot about it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about art as resistance, art as community building, art as identity. This is across all those communities that you saw in the very beginning um, and uh, how, we, uh, how we saw those, those areas. Each one is unique, each one is different. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Highland Park and Highland Park's resistance was due mostly to the Northeast Los Angeles Alliance, which is, which is an artist collective. And in full disclosure, I am a member of them. And so a lot of the imagery that you see here is stuff that I've collected and organizing, organizing with them. Um, but again, this is one of those processes that, that, that I was only there to document 
and in that process, I became radicalized or um, eh, radicalized is a harsh word, but I became activated. And uh, now I consider myself an activist and a photographer and a journalist on these instances. Um, but uh, this was the eviction march that went down Figueroa. And again, honoring the, uh, the creatures that were here first. Um, it was interesting in this case was that we received, uh, uh, and I think it's still up on LA, uh, one of those one of those local uh, websites. Uh, while we were doing this, uh, Twitter exploded, and we had 300 comments in a matter of a day or two talking about this, and how the white folks that were that were in these bars and restaurants as we were walking down putting up evictions notice called us out as racist um, when nothing of the sort was on those eviction notices. We were talking about economics. We were talking about uh, being, um, you know. Uh, uh, um, uh, accepting by the community and being uh, inclusive with the community that was there. Um, and I may have a shot of, of, of the a close up shot of the of the eviction notice. But again, these are artists. This is us planning that that particular thing. Um, and this is, again, something about act, activists and organizing that becomes a very intimate affair. Um, and for those of you who are activists in the crowd or want to be activists, uh, this is something that you have to, you know, you have to go through this process of trust and and uh, uh, understanding each other. And I was at this point, I was an outsider, but um, I became part of the group. I was absorbed into the group. And as you can see, everybody else is considerably younger than me. Uh, but uh, we organized, and we organized uh, to uh, for the same causes and the same reasons. Other artists came along later. Um, I was lucky to, to jump in when I did and see them grow from this. Uh, it was it, we, there was about 30 of, us, 30 of us in this collective. And because of gentrification, half of them were displaced. Actually, more than half were displaced from Highland Park. And now uh, there's no there's probably less than nine, probably less than 10 of us that organize now uh, because of gentrification. But the other folks got pushed to South L.A. So they organized there. Um, and one of the uh, uh, the big signs uh, that came out of uh, one of the art things that we were doing was a lot of signage for the different battles that were going on. Um, now, by no means was this the first. One of the first uh, uh, um, um, things I attended was an Echo Park, and this was 2014, and they were fighting gentrification. And if you know if you know uh, Echo Park, that became a very ugly battle uh, where organizers took on the neighborhood council and uh, literally shut down those meetings. There's some YouTube videos out there that are craziness um, as they are trying to gain control of development because what, what the neighborhood council was doing was basically voting for every good uh, development, small at home, apartment building, everything that, that, you know, that, that they wanted. They wanted these amenities and they weren't doing anything for the people that actually lived there. So the people who lived there, the long-term residents rose up and took over the community, uh, tried, you know, attempted to take over the neighborhood council and other resources that were in there. I don't know where that battle is now. Uh, I've lost kind of touch with a lot of folks there. Um, but again, this is another march uh, talking about our identity and who we are uh, as a culture and as a people um, to show how, how, how we overlap with each other. Um, Latinos are multiple subcultures. If you study, the, if you study this process, there's Chicanos that uh, there's folks that, that uh, identify as Chicanos. There's folks that identify as immigrants. And those are not, those are not, those are kind of exclusive territories, but they have overlap in, in, in some of them. There's folks that identify as indigenous um, Chicanos and there's folks that identify, identify solely as indigenous. Um, and so a lot of that is kind of trying to bridge those gaps with culture. And we found one of the, again, one of those ways was culture, but we found that, that we, we found the one that worked for us because we found the one that uh, represented a lot of our membership. And this was from, um, you'll see, this is, the, this is from an LA, the, our first press coverage, the LA Times photographer took a shot just like this because he was right behind me when he took it, but he worked for the LA Times. So this was on a Sunday uh, edition talking about how displacement is ruining the, the community. And this is before any of the changes. Uh, this business is gone. I was talking about those five businesses sold. This was one of those businesses or the five buildings that sold. This was one of those buildings that sold. Frank's camera, I believe, is right next door. All of this is is gone. Uh, all the iron gates are gone. Um, uh, they have roll away now. Uh, but 
but those businesses have changed and we lost 22 businesses that summer. And this was right before that summer. Uh, the Northeast Alliance in Highland Park, uh, I'm gonna jump into a little bit more. Uh, because of our protests and fame, uh, we became a little bit more well-known. And so we were asked to do uh, art exhibits of our art. And, and this is, again, you can see the mask making was one of those uh, endeavors that we brought in community to, to, um, to, uh, um, to into the art processes. We also built uh, uh, the guitar shot you saw was when we were building this puppet, the giant puppet, the, um, what do we call him? The, uh, uh, um, I forgot what we called him, uh, but he was the, he, he basically was a landlord and a banker. And he, in one home, he had a house. In the other hand, he had a bag of money that he was making from this house. Um, and then you see, uh, whoops, whoa. Um, you see the representation of, of the river and the Arroyo Seco um, on this. And that was, uh, again, at Avenue 50 Studios. Uh, this was some of the early uh, 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 platicas that happened, talking about gentrification. And again, you see how youthful everybody is, um, and uh, this is this is where this is where it started. I think this is where the conversation started was with folks like this in spaces. Um, this was a Union Station. Uh, uh, we were invited to a poetry night there, and we turned the conversation into talking about gentrification um, and. Uh, uh, bringing people in to talk about that. And again, this is probably where I started with them. Uh, again, doing circles um, in community spaces and occupying those spaces and discussing the issues of what gentrification is. And this is a small gathering, but it grows and it builds. If you build community, um, it, it, it multiplies itself, but you have to talk about what community wants to talk about. It isn't driven by the top, it's driven from the bottom up. Um, and that's what you see happening here. Um, and some of those early uh, teach-ins um, uh, we had with uh, the, we had with organizers from uh, the guys who started the, the LA Tenants Union were at this teach-in, and then uh, again we're not crediting ourselves with that that we were all part of learning this, and so uh, uh, these guys came in and I learned from them when I went to one of their teach-ins uh, when we met some folks from uh, from Europe who were doing teach-ins uh, and coming to the states and talking about uh, renters' rights. That, uh, and how they do it in Europe. And when Europe has a, a, a building in, I believe it was uh, either London or Germany, when they have a protest to, um, to fight a landlord, 5,000 people show up because they're used to this unionizing effort. Um, and so this is one of those early meetings where uh, Nella um, and uh, a group called, uh, oh my God, I'm so bad with names. Um, the... Um, all right, ask me later on that one. <laughs> um, but all these groups came together, we're teaching, we're doing a teach-in, we're learning about the processes and things that we need to know um, and discussing the issue. And again, growing community. From that, the LA Tenants Union has started. And if you know the, if you know the area in renters' rights, LA Tenants Union has, become, has gone from one chapter to I believe 14 chapters, 18 chapters citywide. We have one in Northeast Los Angeles, North Hollywood, um, Koreatown, there's another one in Hollywood. There's some on the west side. There's a couple in the valley, I believe. Um, but uh, again, building community. Ah, here we go. This is the sign. Again, back at my favorite spot, uh, the epicenter uh, um, uh, of Cafe de Leche. This is the eviction notices that were posted that night. You're hereby seen for served with this notice. You're being evicted because your business is not accessible to the working class with uh, $4 and $5 lattes and coffee. Um, just two doors down, uh, there used to be a restaurant um, called El Chapin, where all the gardeners would show up in the morning and get a styrofoam cup of coffee for less than a dollar or a dollar and some. And I remember going out there uh, because my office was upstairs and, and, and watching them line up for their coffee. Um, yeah, they're not going to pay $5 for a latte. Uh, your business is not culturally inviting to others to participate in. Uh, you're, you have neglected the consequences that you play that you that you place on renters um, check your privilege uh, again that idea of raising um, the land values within amenities that isn't for local local folks and you can see that it's quite um, quite different than the rest of the community that was there if you know Highland Park um, this is part of that march again this is the ice cream store across the street uh, uh, um, you know and and the flash the, the the pushback that we got from that again was the 300 comments calling us racist on um, 
that blog site. Now, from that, we actually achieved some notoriety and some folks had the crazy idea to invite us to table at an event. And um, <laughs> we were all like, wait a second, what are we gonna table? We don't have any brochures, we're a collective of artists. We go out and we protest, you know, how are we gonna table? And, uh, and uh, we developed a brilliant idea. Well, let's take our table space and culture jam it and let's flip it and let's make a homeless encampment and talk about gentrification with a homeless encampment at the El Mercado on York Boulevard um, that's still going on this year. So the very first year uh, we, we, we uh, did this uh, uh, um, to talk about homelessness because one of the studies that we did was a homeless migration study. And we found that 90% of the homeless people in, in the Arroyo Seco were from Highland Park. And that was almost over out of 200 people living in 65 encampments. So we put some of their stories, as you can see, uh, this one's, this story is about May, who's that little figure there. And again, it's photography and story based. May is homeless because she didn't want to live in an abusive relationship. So she took her five dogs and moved in the Arroyo because it was safer there than it was at her apartment. And then we have four other ones that we have up here. And it was, it was, it was, um, uh, a great hit to talk about this because a couple doors down was another nonprofit called Recycled Resources, which was also talking about homelessness. And I think with this prep, with, when people asked about this, I think it prepared the neighborhood for us to open a year or two later, the Highland Park Emergency Shelter. We had no nobody objecting to it until a year or so later, which was a woman across the street. But because we had talked about that issue of homelessness, there were no NIMBYs out there. Um, and so um, this idea of this homeless encampment, again, was, was more of an art installation than it was tabling. And as you can see, the four folks next to us were trying to sell their, their wares. But I think, I, think, I think we did well for them as well. Um, one of the things that shocked me out of this was that people would come up and ask us, have you seen my cousin in the Arroyo? Have you seen my brother? Have you seen my friend? Again, only reinforcing that the homeless population is our community that's being displaced by these raising rents, these rising rents. And so um, I have a lot of stories about uh, homelessness and, and how it's impacting us. That's another thread. I'm just gonna touch on that one because this one was pretty powerful. And I thought kind of ironic that we ended up here. We weren't invited back the next year, but we did our job for that year. And that was, and we're pretty proud of that. Um, we also did bicycle tours of the community, getting people uh, interested in talking about, you know, uh, a, a lot of stuff. And this also empowered a lot of folks and brought them in. Again, another art project, tie dyeing, and you'll see this tie dyeing exercise um, that our that our homeboy um, uh, started, and you'll see the fruits of it in in one of another art projects. Um, we also had an, uh, some actors and actresses that did a play in one of our uh, pro, uh, projects, and we did this play at Occidental. We also did this play at the um, at the um, Veterans Hall in Highland Park. It was called uh, Columbusine Highland Park. And uh, 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 this uh, member is Columbus and Columbus is partnering up with, um, I don't see them. There was another member that played uh, the local yoga studio owner and, and the, the local, the local uh, yoga studio and Columbus team up to gentrify uh, Highland Park. And uh, that was a really fun play uh, done by one of our members. Um, and then another one, more protest, more aggressive. This was against the mayor and the mayor funding this particular street uh, festival. In the background is the mayor's person uh, uh, on this. And they were totally taken by surprise by this. It was a die-in. And uh, we were again protesting displacement. Um, this was the Great Streets Initiative grant where they got $10,000 to put on this fair. The problem was that the organizers failed to recognize the local folks. They didn't talk about any of that. So once we did the die-in, we also did our own tour that rivaled their tour of the community and we put our own spin on it. And what's funny is that we saw their tour and there was only five people on it. And our tour had 25 people walking around the neighborhood talking about this. So we, in that tour, we visited the uh, um, homeless shelter. We visited across the street, was a cultural center in the eighties. Um, and again, I'm so bad with names, but it was, uh, um, it was, uh, uh, um, uh, um, based on um, on uh, um, the EZLN uh, group and their community building. And I was surprised because I didn't know about that. Um, 
um, and they were there, but there were also other art institutions in the area. And again, that cultural erasure was funded by the mayor and that's why we protested. So what we're doing here is uh, the die-in and is, as our friend here is reading um, these addresses or to, are, are doing the, the, the statement, uh, the folks that are dying, they talk about, they'll read an address and talk about how many people were displaced from that from that house or that apartment building. And again, this is all part of that 17,000 number that you see. Um, and then we also needed workshops. We needed people to understand their rights. So we did workshops in this. And this is one of the crucial things that a lot of people are doing now is tenants rights workshops. We were doing them a full two years before Gil Cedillo and his office started, did their first workshop um, uh, because he was completely clueless of what the community needed. And again, remember he, was quoted as saying displacement is an urban myth. And so here we are doing our workshops, giving community members the tools that they need to fight their landlords and helping them organize. Um, we would bring in attorneys to talk one-on-one -on -one with folks over their leases or problems and issues. Um, this was at uh, where we had to play. This is the, um, the, uh, 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 the veterans hall. Um, and then we did uh, workshops on the street corner. This is Bonavista Vista street. And people were just came walking up and talking to us. And we were asking folks, on how to, you know, what 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 they recognized is what gentrification was. So they populated these maps with post-it notepads, and this actually uh, opened up a new door of of research that uh, I can't talk about now because there just isn't enough time. But this was a beautiful night as as members came up and uh, community members came up. Senoras on their way to the laundromat across the street would roll up, listen to the conversation, uh, say a couple words, go do their laundry, and then come back and participate again. Um, uh, um, but again building community piece by piece, corner by corner. Um, and there's some, again, some of these, uh, some of this information led to a further research as we moved down. Uh, the next step was, again, this was the, one of the developers on, uh, I want to say either Echo Street or, yeah, Echo Street, which is around the corner from the Avenue 50 development. And we decided to start, uh, let's go there. Let's talk about this. Let's make this um, an issue. And so this is the land use and planning department of the neighborhood council. Uh, our members were, uh, were very focused and, and deliberate, but this guy over here went out of control and disrupted the meeting and shut the whole meeting down, which we supported him in that sense, but we weren't there to be angry. We weren't there to have that kind of visceral reaction, but we can understand that we respect that because he was probably one of those folks that was losing his home, losing his, his neighborhood. And, um, uh, you know, that anger comes up very, very quickly. And, uh, but we also need that to move ourselves, but we also need to be um, respective of that, of those, of those changes. So this is the big uh, Marmion Royal Apartments where the 57 families and our dear friend Galena Wasserman um, uh, uh, had bought for $14.2 million. Uh, this was a year long battle. Uh, it started one day. We organized, we, 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 we heard about this building sale. And as you can see, there's its original paint color. Um, and we started talking to tenants. It was a hot July day. Um, and uh, we, knew we, were, we knew we were winning because tenants would come out with cold sodas for us and tell us, um, uh, 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 you're doing great work. Uh, please help us organize. And so we ended up talking to all 57 families. We organized about 45. Six of them ended up getting eviction notice and they, did, they didn't want to help. They couldn't know how to help. So they took their eviction notices and left. But we ended up with 45 people in a tenants union called uh, the Marmion Royal Tenants Union or Union de Inquilinos del Marmion Way or Marmion Royal. Um, and this was our, after we got our feet more organized and we became a union, this was our first march. And over 200 people showed up to this in the street right in front of the building, right between the, uh, the, the, um, the metro station. Uh, sheriffs were watching on their camera. They got so freaked out that they brought in a roll of, of sheriffs to, to watch the platform to make sure that we didn't try to take the train. Although it was a good idea, we didn't do it. We thought about it, but we didn't do it. Um, uh, but this is, this is where it started. And, it, and, and we went down to, again to Gil Cedillo's office because some of these members had been told by Gil Cedillo, there's nothing we can do. This isn't a rent control building. Yes, there is something you can do. You can organize, you can fight. And that's what we did. And so we fought for a year with the landlord um, going on rent strike um, and going into lawsuits and uh, um, uh, um, just constant battles with her. Uh, and I'll explain those as we go along. But uh, this is a Gil Cedillo's office. And uh, you see, again, these are people who are gonna be, lose their homes. Some of these families had already been displaced two or three times. 
um, in one of our community uh, in uh, one of our community events. This was actually a picket of the construction signs, and the senoras came out because the men had to work, so the senoras were the ones. Uh, uh, um, um, you know, they ideated the picket line. They ideated the, uh, you know, what we're going to do. And so this picket of the construction crew actually turned into a convivio, a breakfast convivio um, with um, chilaquiles and everything and aguas frescas. And uh, it became a, a kind of a chat, a community chat session as we blockaded the construction workers from doing their job. Um, and um, it was, again, it was a beautiful thing to watch and be a part of it, of it uh, to help these folks stop their thing. And again, uh, a lot of these ladies were very quiet in the very beginning. They didn't know how to do this. And, and, you know, they, they, you know, so we helped organize, we talked them through this. At one point, some ladies were too shy to talk to the media. And so we did a, um, what they call a, a kind of role playing with the media. And um, we gave them uh, some pointers on uh, how to um, talk to the media. And then they became experts and they were like taking on everybody. In this case, Patty here is breaking it down for the police officer, the, the sergeant that came out during the, um, the picket line of the construction. Um, hey, this is, these are our homes. We paid our rent for forever and, and we have never been laid on a rent. We're not, you know, and they're still evicting us. And this is unfair. This is, and this is what we're fighting. And the police officer was like, okay, I, you know, I get it, you know, and he, and, and later when we were talking, he confided in me that, yeah, they remind me of my family and I'm, and I'm very sorry, I can't do anything about this, but here's what you can do. And he gave us some strategies on how to deal with the police and how to do the picket right, picket line better. And so it's like everywhere we went, we, we, we gained allies. Um, and uh, it was, um, you know, it was again, quite a beautiful thing to watch. It was a year long battle meeting once, twice, three times a week sometimes, um, but it was beautiful. And uh, this is another March as you recall, this was the, the art workshop that we did. We made what was called a uh, Rio Cuatro. Oh, sh okay, I'm sorry. We're go <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. Um, uh, so I'm gonna go through this really quick and uh, organizing Unite. We're actually only 10 slides away, but I do wanna talk about other communities. Boyle Heights had a very militant pushback. This came about a year later. And I remember when I was marching with them, um, uh, this was one of the, the events the landlord that did this actually has property in Highland Park. And so we knew about it. So uh, this was very early on in the, in the early days, 2014. But when he came to Highland Park, we just, we went nuts. So um, this is uh, again, very militant pushback. Uh, Antifa was, was part of the groups, STPLA. There was a lot of groups involved with this. Um, in this case, this particular art owner, this particular gallery owner is trying to shout down a senora who's talking about her displacement. And oh my God, you don't do that. Um, you don't, you don't, you don't, you know, this is, this is, this is what we're talking about, disrespecting community. This guy got picketed so hard that he eventually left Boyle Heights um, and moved to South LA, which was not, was not any better. But, um, but I think about four or five galleries had left because of the, of the efforts that they had done. And again, we salute the Boyle Heights folks because they, they really put their, put it on the line there. Um, and again, uh, in that, that one area. Something that they had, community resources. They had a lot of community cohesion. They had cultural creation spaces. Um, they made their own cultural creation spaces. There was a lot of historic activism going on in there and the network was there. Um, now, some people talk about development corporations and nonprofits being a bad thing, but right now they're also leading the charge at this point in time. Back then it was collective. Now it's something bigger. Um, uh, Lincoln Heights, here's the sad part about Lincoln Heights. We did organize there and uh, we did organize a group of tenants to fight their displacement on Cinco Puntos. But something about Cinco Puntos or Lincoln Heights in general, they don't have community cohesion. They don't have, um, uh, they have an elitist cultural spaces. They have more gentrified cultural spaces. There was some historic activism there at the church. And that's actually where we got to meet was at the, at, at the, at the Episcopalian church there where the, the, the um, beginning of the um, student walkout started. But they have no service providers. It's a black hole of activism, and it doesn't get very. The only reason why we were here is because there was an organizer who lived up the street who knew these families, and we came in full force. Tenants Union, Nella, CCED, and organized these tenants to fight their landlord. And to this point, uh, they're actually still in a legal battle with their landlord in what they call an affirmative lawsuit, which is going to pay off very, very big. 
um, for them. Um, and so they, this is actually another winning site. Whereas the Marmion, they didn't, they didn't, they lost their case, but they spent, they, they were able to save a year's worth of rent, uh, to move to their new place. And you can ask me questions about that. That's a, another tragic story, but this is again, a, a, a demographic of the tenants at the, at the Cinco Puntos, elderly immigrant, no English speaking. Um, he's holding up his eviction notice and he was talking about, you know what, if I get evicted, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to live in my van. And so that made the displacement and homelessness very real. This is, it's not anecdotal, it actually happens. And Zwillo has a, 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 a study where they say, or where they show that uh, for every uh, $2,000 rent, $2,000 rent increase, there's 500 people or five, four, 500 or 5,000 people that end up homeless. El Sereno, this is my last, my last section, I'm almost done. Uh, lots of community cohesion. Uh, cultural creation spaces are abundant. If you know uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Eastside Cafe, um, the, even the Historic Society likes to talk about the history of, of El Sereno. Uh, there's collective and community spaces there. There isn't a lot of historic activism like back to the 60s and 70s, but there is activism there. And because of that activism, because of those community cohesion and those cultural spaces, um, they've managed to be a step, a step ahead. And they have some of the first... Um, uh, community land trusts, which is an, another solution we're looking at to alleviate the housing issues. Um, they don't have a network of, of development, uh, community CDCs. They don't have any nonprofits with the exception of a couple of, of religious ones. Um, the network of community organizers is a very different look than Highland Park and a very different look than um, other areas. And I mentioned the CLT already, um, but you see this is Eastside Cafe and uh, organizing a building of tenants uh, um, actually two buildings of tenants at this point um, during this, this, this history. But again, you see this community cohesion and the muralism is part of that um, surface idea of where the community cohesion is. This is a Samia school. And again, they put a lot of culture into the community itself and the language they use and the um, indigeneity that they practice there is something that, uh, that permeates through the community and how they learn. Um, and, uh, and, and what makes it gives it community cohesion. And so these are, I'm done. I will go to questions. These are some of the researchers that we worked with from all across Sotomayor High School, Minga High School, uh, Oxy, a um, couple of Oxy groups, CCED, tons of people. Uh, these are some of the photographer credits from the Cinturistas group. Um, and then uh, the researchers in the, their very first research project uh, was. Um, was the uh, displacement. And I'll leave you with this. And I'm sorry I talked too much. Thank you for listening. Um, please, somebody say something because I'm All tired right. of hearing I, my I'll, own voice. I'll say something right now. Thank you so much, John. That was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of information, but a lot that I hadn't been aware of uh, that, uh, that really explains what you just see with your eyes. You know, like you say, I do travel back and forth. If, if you could please stop your share screen. Uh, oh, John, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see with my own eyes as I as I travel on the gold line from one place to another. And then uh, th th this is my community uh, in the northeast L.A. You know, the, uh, that uh, you, you're you see the, the big changes, you see the displacement, you see the homeless, the changes of the of the businesses themselves, the, the makeup of the people just walking the streets. Uh, and it's all real and it and it has progressed as you as you say echo park uh silver lake of course a long time before echo park highland park and this community which is being impacted in a in a in what is a real strategic way but then you and and the groups that you're involved with are taking that strategy and and using your strategies to combat this uh a, a question that i have is did the the lockdown you know this year and a half that we've been in the the pandemic did it change or did it have any kind of impact on on these uh these gentrification efforts or in the efforts to stop the gentrification no there's some uh really um great people out there doing uh some great work in groups um they uh uh what if anything it basically um increased the um the fervor and what happened was, is that shifted from, um, uh, well, well two, several things happened. First off, they put, um, 
the moratorium on evictions because of the COVID. And that stopped a lot of stuff. But as those evictions or as this moratorium starts to unwind, you know, some people are saying there's going to be a tsunami of evictions. But then I think the, the governor also put a moratorium and he's going to pay for the rent on some of those people that are getting evicted. So there's a lot of, in this particular state, there's a lot of, 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 of stop measures. Um, one thing though that did happen that was that, uh, that so I think the COVID helped in some parts, but another thing that happened is that mutual aid, when people weren't out organizing and talking to neighbors, mutual aid became the source or the, or not the source, but the uh, kind of goal to help other communities. And so a lot of the tenants rights folks turned into mutual aid, helping some of the, the tenants that they were working with that didn't have jobs and needed food. So you saw food banking go up and you saw a lot of that res the resources go to, to uh, distribution of food and resources like that. Um, what uh, we did, uh, the couple things that, that happened, I saw a question in the chat there, that what happens next? Well, what happens next is we started a couple years ago. And mind you that some of these struggles are, are also from 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, even 2018. But during the COVID, we'd, uh, in 2018, we were already talking about land use and planning and we were doing teach-ins about that. And so during COVID, that's when the city planning department started approving a lot of these projects and things started going through. Uh, because there was no, but there was no kind of uh, um, uh, process to get that or effective process, and so these planning meetings were now being done on done, being done on Zoom, and um, they became a little harder to get access. So sub projects actually got pushed through under the radar without communities' knowledge, and those were what we're fighting right now. Uh, but but that was probably the negative thing that happened out of that. But also um, uh, these uh, these the zoom has kind of helped in a different type of organizing we did one of our teach-ins over uh in person when there was a lull right before the 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 um the uh, holiday um the holiday uh bump and uh or the holiday uh i forget what they're calling it but um it, it was kind of slow enough that we said well let's do an in-group one so we did an outdoor uh um event and it was great to see people and we were you know super super cognizant of of the uh, of the space and the masking and uh, the sharing, but we had a great event. We had two lawyers attending, talking about land use. Some of those people are involved in those battles now, and so I don't think it hindered us. It just changed it and kind of, uh, and it did. I don't think it slowed us down either. I think I think it did. Um, I think it did the opposite. I think it pushed a lot of people to go even more. All right, we have uh, some comments here. Some people that joined us: Michael, Miguel, Paredes. I was born in East LA, raised in Frogtown. Where my parents live oh, today, and I'm back in East LA. And his question is: Since Frogtown was destroyed by gentrification, do you have any advice for how to help East LA avoid the same fate? Um, Frog. Well, okay. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's quite destroyed yet. I, I can say that Highland Park isn't destroyed yet either. There's still 51% of the population is Latino. There's still a lot of culture on the street. There's still a lot of uh, of of of, uh, of gente on the uh, you know doing their thing there, um, I think it's been severely hurt. I think that uh, Boyle Heights has a really um, it's they have really tight organizations, but right you know there's been some uh, since the breakup of of DBH, uh, there's been some uh, kind of like just really territorialism, and that's really sad to watch because you have so much Boyle Heights has so much. Uh, history and culture of of uniting that they should they should unite over this, but again it's that 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 uh, nonprofit corporation that folks are calling out and there's some nonprofits that have done some dumb things. Uh, uh, Elac has you know has has uh, done some dumb things in their in their development and they've tried to fix those things, uh, but in, in but again they've got such a bad reputation that they can't. It's really difficult to, to change that perception. So now anything that's built, and we've had this in Lincoln Heights, again, in Lincoln Heights, because it's devoid of, of, of really some of connection, uh, there were, uh, ELAC develops um, affordable housing. And, uh, and the minute they put a sign up that says there's gonna be affordable housing here, people jump on it that it's gentrification. And affordable housing is something we need. Uh, in Lincoln Heights, we had the five lots. Um, that was five, uh, five affordable lot housing projects that we needed. Unfortunately, they were tied to Cedillo and everybody hated Cedillo, so nobody wanted those projects built. And, and so they didn't get built, um, sadly enough. 
but uh, um, but uh, I guess I, I, I think that uh, the collectives and the people on the street and the community uh, need to get together. And I know the community folks are more interested in, in uh, community land trusts and uh, and building. A, there's a there's another group that just came out that's doing um, uh, shared ownership. So so six families can buy an apartment building. They're hoping to try to, to, to figure out a funding mechanism for that. Uh, I forgot what they what they call it. And, and again, I'm really bad with names if I don't have my notes with me. I can write it down and, and write an article and tell you about it, but my brain is too filled with facts and stuff. So, so but that that initiative of, of community living and, and co-op living of buying a property and dividing it between six or seven or eight families or more uh, is an issue that's out there, but they need to find the funding mechanism. Same with community land trusts. And so there's a couple of collective groups working on that. And there's even some nonprofit groups working with collective groups on how to do that. So um, I think uh, the people that have been very militant have done a great job at bringing up the ideas of that. Um, and, and I think they should continue to do that and point out the things that are wrong. But I think we also need to take the next step in uh, figuring out how to, um, you know, Boyle Heights is 81% renters. How do we convert those renters into ownership, into not just ownership of culture, but ownership of the land? Um, and that's that's the that's the problem that I think some of these that we folks need to solve. All right, thank you. Uh, just uh, some people that tuned in, uh, Alegra Padilla. Thanks all who made this possible. It's important to get involved on all levels. Uh, Vanessa Delgadillo, she's uh, watching from Glass Hill Park. Hashtag Nella. Uh, Mona Garcia, hate that I'm ready to purchase and can't realistically purchase in Nela where I grew up. Uh, Patricia yeah. Nazario, this is an awesome talk. Isabel Rojas Williams, good job, John. Abrazos. Isabel. <laughs> yeah, abrazos fraternales. Uh, Patricia uh, Nazario is asking, I'd be curious to hear more about political inaction, say, Gil Cedillo's office, and how that affects communities. You caught me on the right day. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're doing a, a couple projects. Uh, yeah, Gil Cedillo is, is useless, uh, but we're also in El Sereno, some of the, the groups that I work with. Uh, and El Sereno uh, is facing, I told you, uh, 32 homes, uh, luxury homes. That one uh, might be cut down because of, or cut down or, or, or blocked because of the environmental impact. Uh, you know, th there's also some potential uh, that it's going to uh, um, uh, uh, destroy. Uh, some indigenous land, uh, as well as some uh, some rare and protected trees. But the big one is the 42 small lot homes on, Le on Lombardy and Eastern, which is uh, closer to USC and closer to Cal State LA. They want to take a five acre hillside and cover 70% of it with concrete. Now, it's funny because the developer talks about it. And he says, we're going to have 30% of open space um, when, when they sell the project and they use their PR machine. Uh, but then again, we're looking at almost 170 trees, uh, an urban woodland uh, with rare, uh, rare and protected uh, um, uh, black oak tree, black 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 oak trees that are um, 39 of them are going to be pulled. Now, this is one of the only areas in the world uh, that has this many trees. In Southern California, there are very few. Cal Southern California is the only place that has them. This is the air in El Sereno is one of the only um, uh, areas that has this many trees. Um, and so that's going to be lost. They, they're pulling 39 out, 39 of them out, but the other 130 are going to be uh, at risk because they're covering it with so much concrete. And, and our, one of our, our, our team folks, an arborist, uh, always talks about how these trees will suffer from uh, the concrete or, or suffer from the concrete that they're going to pour around there because it doesn't allow them to breathe. And um, if you're anything and you understand the, the mycenaeal network of how the ground and the earth work and how trees communicate with each other, you'll realize that, yeah, that's true. 70% of the hillside is going to be covered in concrete and it's going to kill the rest of the trees off eventually. Um, the other thing with this is that the, these are $1.3 million homes uh, and they're twice as, almost twice as big as the, how, the houses surrounding them. So that's definitely gonna raise the property value. There's a lot of rentals in the neighborhood. There goes the rental value on that. Um, the big argument with this right now is uh, for the community is that 11,000 dump trucks, uh, imagine 11,000 dump trucks on your street right now for more than a year and a half or two years, 
that are going to be removing that hillside to build these 42 luxury homes um, and the cons and, and they're diesel trucks and they're going to be going all day long there are two schools across the street there's a play there's also a community center across the street um, this is the impact of this of this particular site is unbelievable and i say this uh, i know the question was about about government well here's the thing uh, kevin de leon has come out as an environmentalist and he has not taken a stand against this project. He does not see this project as something uh, that he that he wants to get too involved. He's kind of waiting and seeing to see what's going to happen. Um, again, uh, uh, he this should be strong. This should be high up on his agenda. A lot of it, they're kind of pointing the finger. His staff is pointing the finger at um, the fact that our previous councilman, who was under indictment for um, uh, corruption. Uh, dropped the ball on this, which, okay, yeah, he did. Yeah, he was under indictment. He did drop the ball. Um, and this project basically, uh, we're, 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 one of our lawsuit arguments is that um, the, uh, um, the, uh, the Brown Act was violated because there was little or no notice given to the last meeting that this was decided upon. And there was nobody there from the community. In the first meeting, 20, 30 people stood up and talked and spoke against this. Letters were written, all kinds of, of pushback. And then the meeting after that, nobody was there to discuss it because there was no notice given to the community that this was even under uh, under uh, uh, under a vote. So they voted for it. They said yes. Um, and now we have this project, and uh, we're again we're, we're 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 saying no. And so we've instituted the lawsuit against us. And Kevin De Leon, I believe he can do something. But he won't, and this is the same thing that we uh, that we asked with Cedillo. Uh when the Marmion tenants marched to his office. We this was two years before he actually did it. We asked him to to, to put a moratorium on no fault evictions. No fault evictions being what the Marmion tenants were suffering from. Well, he didn't do it for two years, and finally he did it when COVID and, and more evictions started to happen. He was you know he he started he became a friend of the of the uh, of the tenants union and such. Kevin De Leon the same thing. He could make a motion to the to um, excuse me to reopen this land use file, and 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 because of one because of of our former councilman who was under indictment, two because nobody was notified, three the notices were not in Spanish, uh, um, and then and I haven't even started on the on the uh, on the environmental impacts of that. Uh, um, th there's a one lady who is a. Uh, Who's part of our team? Who is a science advisor for folks? And she made a, a, a an enormous list of why the environmental um, uh, uh, impact of this is such a joke, and the mitigation measures of the developer are such a joke uh, that include uh, a, a state violation and all kinds of other things. But the more the, to, to answer your question, Kevin De Leon has not taken a step on this, and we've met with him, and he hasn't taken a step. Again, it's the politics of this, um, and a lot of times what we find of in, in other projects that he is part of, I, like I mentioned, the USC one, we've been in, in talks with him. And, and a lot of times he wants to play uh, the mediator and figure out what the community wants and balance it with what the developer wants. But the developer is from Orange County. He doesn't know this community. He wants to, again, pave it with 70% of, of, of uh, concrete. So, so that's uh, one to, to, that's still active. That's one to watch for. Uh, what uh, Another question, uh, Taking this back a little bit further with the with the Boyle Heights, why was self help graphics targeted, and how how do they or did they or do they contribute to gentrification? Um, that's a really fine line, and um, I, I I I I it's funny. I had this I had this same conversation with Isabel Rojas, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's a very fine line because again Avenue Fifty. Is in the same boat. Uh, a lot of their artwork is sold to uh, uh, folks who gentrify the neighborhood, uh, who are looking for you know authentic artwork from the community. Um, and uh, um, but I think uh, this was this was before. Uh, and in self help graphics case, you have to realize that, that the self help graphics that a lot of us knew is not the same self help graphics that's there now. This is the self-help graphics that Sister Karen Brocolera um, had run, and it was a very personal space. It was a very intimate space, um, and a lot of artists were there. And uh, it was 
again, um, funded by uh, uh, um, the church and the donations and a very, you know, uh, community of donations. As it evolved and as it changed, you saw folks that were, uh, um, that, that were coming in and you saw bigger funders, corporate funders, and automatically when you see corporate funding, um, you think the worst because uh, they want something for it or they, or they have a, an agenda and they're just trying to make themselves look good. Um, and so we tend to shy away from that. But also um, it wasn't the same uh, uh, um, self-help graphics. And you had some artists that were on this and some artists that were uh, uh, against this. Uh, some artists were for gentrification, some artists were against gentrification. And that was what I was talking about earlier was this cohesion of community. And uh, I know now, uh, uh, I recent, was recently at uh, Self Help Graphics, it's changed again, it's, it's evolving. And you see a lot of, uh, of talk of anti-gentrification. Um, and I recently did a talk with some kids there about anti-gentrification. And uh, um, you, see, uh, you see that, All again, right. the mindset changing. All right, well, uh, one final question. What is the role of artists as our community hosts a large sector of artists? This from, a high, from Highland Park or could anywhere really? Well, here's, the, here's the, the, the tragic part is when you say, when you ask that question is that I have to think about all the communities that I see there. And I go to, I, I think of Lincoln Heights and um, the cultural institution that's there, uh, again, was an elitist cultural, uh, elitist cultural institution. Uh, and the artists that are there that are working there are primarily white artists and a primarily gentrifying artists. And, and part in, in participating in that. And I remember getting into a really big discussion over Instagram with a photographer at the brewery over gentrification and how he believes that he's doing good for the community when he comes in here and rents the space and, um, you know, and, and, and tries to argue his point about, uh, uh, about why, why gentrification is good. And I'm like, no, 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 you're missing, you're missing the entire displacement, you know, point of view. Um, and so, uh, uh, but then you look at Highland Park and Highland Park has a long tradition of, of artists going back to the seventies and the arts and the, the, the major arts collectives there uh, from the sixties and seventies. Um, and again, I'm, my name, my uh, names are drawing a blank uh, up to, but then even into the eighties, I was talking about that, that EZLN uh, style collective that was uh, off of 56. Um, they, there, there's another arts collective. And uh, today, I mean, you go back to the history of, of Highland Park and it was essentially the first artist community. You have white artists and uh, brown artists all at, the, um, all at the same thing in the same community. Uh, the first artists were there were white artists that uh, were there that came over with um, the founder of the Southwest Museum. Um, I forget Lummis. his name. Because, what's that? Lummis. Lummis, yes, thank you. Uh, names and... Big, a big soup of names uh, and Lummis. And you look at uh, up on uh, up around Garvanza area, you have some of the first arts collectives up there is uh, the glass studio uh, that's right there. And then also the printing press that was run by uh, um, another another well-known artist family, um, Jackson Brown's family who, who ran the first printing press in the area. Um, and so it, it, there's just a long tradition of it. In El Sereno, it's community artists. All those murals that you see there are community, uh, you know, uh, expressing themselves. So I think if you're going to say artists, you have to use the term uh, more specifically to the people that uh, that are there, that uh, are longtime residents, and how can they create art? So if you're an artist and you and you can teach art, then teach it to the community. If uh, if you're an artist and you're making art. Um, and a lot of the folks I've seen and found in the movement are uh, artists, uh, not just from Nella, but even in uh, the um, in the uh, LA Tenants Union. There's a lot of writer and artists in those in those groups, um, and they're activating themselves and using their skills to create this this bigger movement and, and make people aware of it. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. Well, it, it, I think you did. You might have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, just final uh, thoughts here from, from some of our Facebook uh, compañeros here. Uh, Miguel Paredes, when you, 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 
he you had mentioned uh he said that it was destroyed you said it's not destroyed yet he begs to differ he says his frog town was destroyed by gentrification that's not coming back he sees east l.a as a mecca for the chicano so he's trying himself to save el pino and create a green space instead of allowing developers in east l.a and then uh, finally carlos j the j leon says city terrace is next so uh so with that, I know that uh, what you presented, John, a lot of information, very complex, but at the same time, very, you know, it, it's, we, we feel, we feel the effects of this, sure. of homelessness, of, of, uh, of gentrification. And you just layered it with, with a lot of data that uh, uh, at the face of it is, is daunting, but just the way that you presented it, we're able to, to, to pinpoint what the issues are and how they could affect not just those particular sections that are in the process of being developed, targeted for development, but also the, how it affects the surrounding areas and, and how it's really just, uh, you know, making it difficult for people to live in the places that they want to live, uh, our community. Um, with that, John, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. Uh, we broke the record here. John. I mean, I'm that, sorry. I'm no sorry. Problem. No, no, we're, I'm happy. Uh, it's a lot of info. All of you out there who, who stuck it through the whole thing, congratulations. If you didn't catch everything, you came in a little bit late, you want to see the entire re uh, session, we've recorded it. We're going to place it on our YouTube page probably tomorrow. It'll live on our Facebook page at La Plaza LA, YouTube at La Plaza LA, and we also post them on our website, LAPCA. Dot org. That's where we had, we keep all of our En Casa Con La Plaza se sessions. Uh, and this is, this is, this will be one. Um, coming up. Yeah, we're, we're going to do it one more time this week with uh, the return of Dan Guerrero. He was supposed to have come on a couple of weeks ago with a uh, music producer, entrepreneur, and the father of Selena, A.B. and Susana Quintanilla, Abraham, Abraham Quintanilla. He'll be with us this Friday both of them with uh, July 30th at seven o'clock, joined by Nancy De Los Santos. Uh, and then uh, we start again next week. We have a couple scheduled here. First of all, uh, on August 2nd, Salsa Luchadora. It's our cooking demo with Samantha Martinez. And, uh, and then Dan comes on again next Friday uh, with guest Enrique Castillo. We cover the spectrum here. We have our celebs. We have our um, performers that have come on our, our cooks, basically our culture is presented here on Encasa Con La Plaza. History, art, culture, music, uh, and mucho, mucho más. A lot of it reflected on our exhibitions there at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, where we do have in their Ally Starts Here um, exhibition. We talk about a gentrific gentrification. We talk about uh, a redlining. We give those stories that John so so uh, both eloquently and also so so powerfully uh, uh, you know presented tonight. It's a lot to to really take in, but but thank you for that, uh, John. And um, so good night to everybody. Good night to you, John. Can I make a big plug before we go? Make a big plug. Okay, so two things: uh, like us on Facebook, the Northeast Los Angeles Alliance, and also the Lombardi Eastern. Uh, struggle against the 42 lot homes. We're also on Facebook. Just uh, look up uh, Lombardi Eastern and you'll find us. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much okay, for so having me. I'm typing it in here on the, the comments. So Facebook, it's Lombardi and what else? Lombardi Eastern and then Northeast Los Angeles Alliance. Eastern. All right. Northeast Los Angeles Alliance. And we're on Instagram too. All right, I should have been ready for this one, but but uh, those of you who are out there, you know, you, you know, you're the internet. You know how it works. Check out, check it out. Lombardi, of course, is the property that's in El Sereno, and the Northeast Alliance uh, is is the the group that you're associated with, right? Correct. John? All Correct. right. Yes. So, so check them out on Facebook. Do that search, like them, uh, and then get involved. All right. Thank you very much. John, See we'll ya. See you at All the right. train. All right. Bye-bye.